Hello everyone. For tonight, we are going to follow thousands of years of human history and travel to many places around the world. Textiles are among the most important early inventions of mankind. They are not only useful, especially for clothing, they reveal social customs, culture, aesthetics, technologies. Generation after generation, millions of our ancestors have worked at pressing or spinning fibers, at weaving or knitting, at dyeing, painting, embroidering. We will talk about many different types of textiles, where they come from, what they were used for, from the most current ones like cotton or wool, to the most precious like silk. Clothing is another aspect we will touch on tonight. It actually started before weaving, and we will explore how clothing evolved from prehistory to the present with the textiles, the styles, the appearance of Western fashion a few centuries ago, and all the cultural significance attached to clothes. This gives us many different aspects to discuss, but you can relax and let me do the work. Sit or lay down comfortably. Release the tension in your shoulders and your limbs. We're going to take all this methodically and it's all going to be easy and relaxing to follow. The pictures you can see right now are paintings of ancient textiles by an artist based in Brooklyn, Gail Rothschild. She was kind enough to let me use some of her works, which I found very appropriate to tonight's story. These are portraits of ancient textiles that invite us to focus on textures and how they result from the spinning of fibers, the use of thread, the choices of colors, the ingeniosity and uh, artistic expression that went into them. Textiles are highly cultural creations and they are often in this grey area between crafts, decoration and art. But as I told you in various stories already, this distinction between crafts and fine art or decorative art is a modern concept. For much of human history, artisans and artists were the same. And even today, it is always enlightening to think of artisans as artists and vice versa, to really understand what they do. There is always a combination of physicality and emotion or intellect. You will find a link to Gail's website in the description and if you happen to be there, her next big exhibition will be in 2021 in Berlin at the Bode Museum. A series of new large-scale paintings of ancient textiles that will be presented alongside the pieces that inspired them. Now we are about to begin our exploration journey. If you wish to navigate the story, you will find timestamps in the first comment pinned under the video, together with a link to my Patreon page where you can download stories if you wish to have them available offline and you can support the channel 
thank you very much for 300 patrons, by the way. You can also listen to more than 40 of my stories on Spotify, Apple Music, Amazon or Deezer. And the library keeps growing every week. So that's an option if this is more convenient for you. And now, let's get started. When did mankind start to wear clothes? Long before textiles were invented, in fact. Research indicates that humans may have begun wearing clothing as far back as 100,000 to 500,000 years ago. Probably animal fur and skin. Possibly clothing made of leaves or other vegetal material. We don't exactly know. But the most ancient sewing needles that have been discovered have been dated to at least 50,000 years ago. And we're going to see that textiles appeared tens of thousands of years later. From 20,000 to 30,000 years ago, we have figurines found in Europe that depict clothing pieces. There are skirts made of twisted fibers, hats or caps, belts, Archaeologists also found various artifacts used in textile making, like weaving sticks. The oldest of them have been dated to more than 7,000 years ago. It is unclear exactly when a transition to actual textile happened, as opposed to skins sewn together. But the first type of textile was probably felt. Felt is not a woven fabric. It is obtained by matting and pressing natural fibers together. The ancient process only works with animal hairs. Hot water is applied to layers of animal hairs. And then when the fibers are agitated and compressed, they hook together into a single piece of fabric. It doesn't work well with vegetal fibers because they don't have this property to curl and form a single piece when they are soaked in hot water and pressed. This technique probably appeared in Central Asia and it is still used by nomadic tribes to make clothing yurts, boots or rugs. It is a very useful material because it is water repellent. It doesn't burn easily. It absorbs sound. And actually, even though it is not a very common type of textile, you may own some. It is used to cover pool tables, bridge tables, game tables in casinos or as a damper in many musical instruments, like in pianos. About 8,000 years ago, woven textiles appeared around the world, and evidence of their presence can be found on every continent, at least in regions that were dry enough to preserve them. That includes the Middle East, China, India, North Africa, and uh, dry parts of America, especially Peru. It is less certain when textiles were first made in uh, regions around the equator or the tropics, because all textiles are relatively fragile, and they survive thousands of years only in uh, the driest regions. But it is likely that they spread all around the world during the Neolithic. We know that this period was rich in uh, migrations that propagated uh, innovations at a very slow pace compared with our modern standards. <laughs> 
it took centuries or thousands of years, but this is still uh, not that much relative to uh, mankind's history. It seems the first fibers used in woven textiles were vegetal, and the first one was flax, also known as linen, long before cotton. Flax was cultivated at least 8,000 years ago in the Middle East. It is a crop that serves for food. The seeds are edible and give linseed oil, and the stem gives fibers that are very strong, stronger than cotton, and relatively smooth. From the Near East, the cultivation of flax spread to Europe, to India, to China, where it was present about 5,000 years ago. Flax was cultivated extensively in ancient Egypt, for example, where it was used for clothing, for sails, and to bury people as a shroud or to wrap mummies. In the entire Mediterranean world, and in Europe. People relied mainly on linen for plant-based textiles. They also used a lot of wool. We'll talk about that later. But at the time, cotton was very rare in this part of the world. The Phoenicians traded Egyptian linen throughout the Mediterranean. The Romans adopted it, and several centuries later, in the European Middle Ages, it was still a very important fiber. In Europe, the industry was centered on Flanders. The crop was cultivated in Northern Europe, and then it was processed and turned into cloth, including dyed around Flanders, and exported via medieval trade routes. If you are interested, in uh, how dyes were produced and uh, how the taste in color evolved in this period, I made a story called uh, History of Colors recently. I'll put a link in the description. Linen dominated vegetal fibers in the West until the 18th century, when uh, cotton replaced it. At first, cotton and uh, Cotton fabrics mainly came from India, but as cotton products grew in popularity, the Europeans took control of this industry. Cotton was introduced to their colonies in America as a colonial crop. They imported the raw material from America and India and produced textiles in uh, a region centered on England and the north of France. We will return to the history of cotton a little bit further down the road. There were several steps involved in the production of textile, be it with linen, cotton or wool. They haven't changed that much even though they have been industrialized and they are still practiced to make fabric with natural fibers. First, the raw material has to be prepared. Fibers are washed in a first cleaning phase. Then comes carding and combing. These are methods to uh, disentangle and straighten out the fibers. Once the raw material has been prepared, it is turned into thread or yarn by spinning. Spinning is the action of pulling and twisting the fibers. It could be done manually with a sort of spike. This is probably how it began. But during the antiquity or the Middle Ages, it is a bit unclear. The spinning wheel was introduced, first in India and the Islamic world. From there it reached Europe and became widely used. The spinning wheel increased productivity 
and helped produce regular yarn and it was fundamental in the textile industry prior to the industrial revolution when it was replaced with other machines. After spinning, the yarn had to be woven and this was made on a loom. Threads were arranged vertically from the top of the loom when it was vertical or from one side. This was called the warp. And then the weaver passed a horizontal thread, the weft, through the vertical threads using a shuttle to ensure that the piece of fabric remained tight, the weft thread was pushed every time it had been passed through the warp. At this point, after hours or days or even weeks of work, a piece of cloth was obtained, but there were finishing stages. For woolen cloth, there was fooling which was the process of soaking it in water and then beat it with hammers to tighten the threads. Then dyeing and eventually printing. Printing and dyeing were the big advantages of cotton because this fiber works very well with color. So I told you cotton fabrics replaced linen for the most part in the West. But cotton also has a very ancient history of its own. In the ancient world, cotton was produced and used in two main centers, India and America. The oldest known cotton fabric was dated to 8,000 years ago and it was found in Peru. It is believed that this is where the plant was first domesticated. There were also cotton textiles in North America. There is evidence that it was cultivated 5,000 years ago in Mexico and Arizona by pre-Columbian Native American peoples. The other historical region of origin of cotton, where it was probably domesticated independently from the Americas, was India. The Greeks, and later the Romans, knew about cotton. To them it was an imported luxury good that uh, arrived via ancient trade routes like the Silk Road. They marveled at cotton because it was very smooth and light and they considered it superior to wool or linen. Cotton could also fix very vivid colors, contrary to wool, and the only fabric considered even better was silk, which was another imported good. A bit of cotton cultivation happened in Egypt in the antiquity, but it never became big or replaced linen and wool. Cotton became a bit more common in Europe in the Middle Ages, but it was still relatively rare. It was introduced to Spain and Sicily in the south of Italy with uh, the Muslim conquest. These regions were retaken later and cotton manufacture became an industry in the north of Italy and Flanders. The raw material arrived via Venice. It was one of the products that Venetian traders brought from their travels to the Near East. They also imported a lot of ready-to-sell Indian fabrics that had transited through Persia and the rest of the Middle East. At the time, these fine Indian fabrics were considered superior to anything the European industry could make. And this domination lasted until the 18th century. India exported to China, to the Muslim world, and to Europe.
even though it took time for Europeans to realize where the textiles came from. For example, there is a type of cotton fabric called muslin. Its name comes from the city of Mosul in Iraq, from where Europeans supposed it came from. In reality, muslin only transited through Iraq and came from various production centers in India. The biggest one was located in the east of India, in Bengal, around the city of Dhaka, which is the capital of Bangladesh nowadays. But there were several. The rulers of India in the 16th to 18th centuries encouraged the production of cotton and cotton textiles, and it grew a lot until the 18th century. Chinese and Muslim traders were joined by Portuguese, then Dutch, then English and French buyers, who sailed to India via the south of Africa, and over time also took charge of this trade in Asia. It is estimated that in the 18th century, Indian textiles were by far the most important manufactured good in world trade. These uh, textiles could be found from America to Japan, and that became a problem for European trading nations, because at the same time they had little to offer. India was largely self-sufficient, and European products were not in high demand. So they had to export large quantities of precious metals to pay gold and silver, to pay for these uh, Indian products. And this was one of the reasons that pushed European countries to try and develop their own cotton industry. They increasingly imported raw materials and developed their own printing industry with new patterns. An example of that is a type of decorating pattern called toile de jouy that started in the 18th century. It consists of a repeated pattern on a plain background, generally white, and the pattern is in color. Traditionally, it depicts pastoral themes or an arrangement of flowers. These patterns originated in Ireland, but they became very popular in France and in the UK in the 18th century, and the production grew exponentially in these two countries. They were used a lot to uh, cover furniture, to cover walls or for curtains. The name, Toile de Jouy, means cloth from Jouy, which is a city near Paris. The need for always more cotton motivated the development of the crop in colonies, in the West Indies mainly, where the plant was already present before the Europeans arrived, like they had started to do with other colonial crops like sugarcane, coffee or tobacco. They developed plantations and Cotton became one of the main colonial products in the 18th century. This had dramatic consequences in other parts of the world. The worst is that it stimulated demand even more for African slaves. In total, it had begun before, but cotton alone was responsible for the deportation of hundreds of thousands maybe even a few millions African people to the Caribbean and later to the United States. In the years following independence, the US were not a big cotton producer, it was even very marginal, but it took off spectacularly in the 19th century. By the middle of the 19th century, cotton producing states like Georgia, Missouri, Louisiana, Alabama, 
had small populations, but 50% of this population were slaves, many of them born in America from parents brought one or two generations earlier. Another consequence of Europeans and later Americans taking control of the cotton industry was the decline in India's industry. It wasn't completely ruined, but European production became cheaper and caught up in quality, which only accelerated with the Industrial Revolution. The US became a major provider of raw cotton and replaced India as the main exporter of this commodity. The two main clients were the UK and France, and during the Civil War, the Confederacy even tried to force the two countries to intervene against the North by starving them of cotton. It implemented an embargo over cotton. This is sometimes referred to as cotton diplomacy. It didn't work, but the fact that it was uh, tried shows how important the supply of cotton and the, the textile industry in general had become to these countries by then. Flax and cotton were the two main vegetal fibers used in textiles, but there were, there still is, animal fibers too, like wool and uh, the most precious and labor-intensive of them all, silk. Let's take a look at them now. Silk is about 6,000 years old, and uh, as you know, it originated in China, during the Neolithic. For a very long time, several thousand years, silk remained confined to China, until the opening of the Silk Road in the last centuries BC. But even after the Silk Road appeared, and silk products reached the Near East, India, and the Mediterranean, China kept a monopoly on silk production for another millennium, because no one outside China knew how to produce it. We think of silk mainly as a luxury good nowadays, a very fine and precious kind of textile, and it always was expensive. But it was much more mainstream a few centuries ago, before the price of cotton dropped and before synthetic fibers like nylon replaced it for a fraction of the cost. As you know, silk is a thread produced by an insect, the silk moth, when its larva is a caterpillar and prepares its transformation, it produces a cocoon made of a very thin but strong thread. With this thread, very light and shimmering textiles can be woven. There is a legendary tradition in China that presents the origin of silk as an accident. A silkworm's cocoon would have fallen into the teacup of an empress. She tried to extract the cocoon from her drink and began to unroll the thread. Then she had the idea to weave it and marveled at the resulting textile. She observed the life of the silkworm and began to instruct people in the art of raising them, sericulture. This secret was kept in China until the middle of the first millennium AD. Silk was exported but its origin remained a mystery. The Romans were confused about it. They thought the fabric was uh, harvested from tree leaves. They knew that it came from 
silkworms, but they believed the caterpillars wove the cloth directly on trees, like spiders. Early on, silk provoked a real craze in the Chinese high society because of its lightness, shimmering appearance and uh, apparent perfection, so much that it was restricted to the members of the imperial family, and this prohibition lasted for about a millennium. The right to wear silk was reserved to the emperor and a few very highly placed people as a sign of distinction. Some silks are shinier than others. The appearance is due to the structure of the threads. They have a prism-like shape that refracts light from every angle. After centuries, the right to wear silk was finally extended to a larger circle, but it remained prohibited to the masses. It was even forbidden for peasants, that is to say, the vast majority of the population, to even touch it. And this prohibition was lifted only under the Qing dynasty in the 17th century. But silk was not limited to clothing. It also served as a form of paper. Paper is another Chinese discovery. It could be made with various raw materials, with bamboo, straw, linen, and also silk. In the 2nd century BC, under the Han dynasty, the second imperial dynasty in China, silk paper began to be produced, and it became the first type of luxury paper. At the same period, Silk even became more than a material. It was also a bit like a currency, because it was very valuable in its own right. It could be used to pay high-ranking government officials, or to reward wealthy citizens, or as a tribute. The length of silk cloth was a monetary standard in China like the weight of gold. Silk reached other parts of the world long before the Silk Road was uh, opened and uh, a regular arrival of the product was put in place. The late ancient Egyptians knew it and so did the Greeks and the Romans before the opening of the Silk Road in the 2nd century BC because in the previous centuries Small quantities managed to leave China, but it became available in much bigger quantities with the Silk Road, and the fame of silk and its price threatened the Chinese monopoly over its production. The Chinese were very aware of this. There was an imperial decree that condemned to death anyone attempting to export silkworms or their eggs. But their monopoly was finally broken. First in 380 by the Japanese. An expedition could capture silkworm eggs and uh, four young Chinese girls who were forced to teach the art of sericulture to their captors. The Japanese refined their techniques and over the following centuries, sericulture spread to a larger scale in Japan. In the West, it is believed the first successful attempt happened in the 6th century, in the Byzantine Empire. Monks managed to smuggle eggs hidden in rods of bamboo and Byzantium was able to establish a silk industry. Slightly later, so did the Arabs, who introduced it across the shores of the Mediterranean, like they did with cotton. This didn't kill the Chinese silk industry. 
which had several thousand years in experience and continued to produce the highest quality silk fabrics in the following centuries. Then techniques of silk production reached the rest of Europe after the beginning of the Crusades in the Middle Ages and a new production center appeared in the north of Italy. It was reinforced after the Fourth Crusade during which Constantinople, the capital of the Byzantine Empire, was sacked and uh, the silk industry was ruined in Byzantium. Hundreds of skilled weavers relocated to Italy, and with the rise of the Ottoman Empire in the east, which reduced European access to imported silk or made it more expensive, Italian silk prospered. The long tradition for fine textiles in northern Italy started a really long time ago, in the Middle Ages. It was made possible by the concentration of trading cities like Venice and Genoa that imported know-how and new materials to an area that was well populated with wealthy patrons that were a solid client base for luxury textiles and luxury goods in general. By the 15th century, Chinese silk kept reaching Europe, but at this point more than half the production had become European, mainly Italian. Then, in the 16th century, the European center of silk moved to the other side of the Alps, to the city of Lyon in France. France was having a similar problem with the Italian city-states that Italy had had before with Indian or Chinese products arriving via the Silk Road. There was a massive trade deficit that transferred too much precious metals to Italy. So French kings tried to develop a national industry because with its large population and uh, higher classes that were willing to spend fortunes in luxury goods, plus the emergence of a new phenomenon called fashion. We'll come back to that later. France had become the biggest consumer of silk at the time. Of course, for centuries, most of the demand for precious imported goods had come from a small group of nobles and wealthy bourgeois. Royal courts across Europe were a big chunk of this demand for luxury goods. But in the 16th century, this reached unprecedented levels. At the courts of Henry VIII in England, Francis I in France, in wealthy Italian city-states like Venice or Florence, in Rome around the popes in Madrid, courtiers and the high aristocracy began to spend more than ever on clothing or jewels. It was absolutely common for these people to spend several times the life income of a regular person for just one outfit that they would wear only once. It is this high demand for luxury products that made the luxury goods industry emerge in Europe, in Italy, and even more in France, because demand was very strong and constantly renewed by changes in fashion. So Lyon became the new European capital of the silk trade in the 16th and 17th centuries because it had been granted a trade and manufacturing monopoly and it became successful at creating new patterns and new styles that were used for high-end clothing, for tapestries or furniture. In the 17th century, there were more than 10,000 looms 
dedicated to silk manufacturing in Lyon, and this industry supported a third of the city's population. This was huge for pre-industrial times. When the Industrial Revolution began, in the last decades of the 18th century, its main focus was textile, and many innovations were driven by the cotton industry, essentially in the UK. As we have seen before, cotton became a, a major commodity, but silk stayed on the side, because a lot of productivity gains in textiles were made in spinning, thanks to new machines. Silk is already a thread, so it didn't benefit from it. Also, it was and remained a luxury product. When the price of cotton cloth was dropping, which made it accessible to a larger market, weaving precious silk fabrics that often incorporated silver or gold threads was a very delicate process. It was made in small quantities and it couldn't be fully industrialized. So as giant factories with thousands of workers were beginning to appear, silk production always remained semi-industrial. There were useful innovations though, like the jacquard loom, which was a mechanical loom with a string of punched cards that automatically wove the patterns. This loom is quite famous because it was a precursor from the 1800s to computers. The system of punched cards was a limited but effective form of programming. And actually punched cards remained in use until the 1970s in computing. But with the Industrial Revolution, European silk started to decline and never recovered. It was very labor-intensive and uh, innovations and productivity gains could not fully compensate for the rise in costs. Instead of dropping, like the cost of raw cotton, the cost of silkworm cocoons was on the rise. And with uh, smooth and colorful cotton products becoming much, much cheaper, demand for silk decreased. It became more attractive again in the 19th century to import it from China or Japan, which had also become quicker with the opening of the Suez Canal. And silk production in Italy or in Lyon became uh, marginal. It still exists, but it is now limited to very high-end products or fabrics to restore antique objects like tapestries or seats covered in silk. So it was a uh, counterintuitive outcome of the Industrial Revolution in Europe. But as a result of it, China became again, and by far, the biggest producer of silk in the world, which is a spot it uh, retains to this day. We are going to talk about clothing, but before that, we have to take a look at one last very important type of fiber, wool, which also has a history of its own. I told you at the beginning that the most ancient known form of textile was felt, which was not woven but pressed and made of animal fibers. Animals produce different kinds of fibers that have a uh, rather similar chemical composition but different structures. Wool is different from hair or fur. They all grow from specialized cells located in the skin called follicles. 
but there are different types of follicles producing different types of fibers. Their diameter, their crimp, or their elasticity can vary a lot. Wool is finer than hair and fur, and this gives it a higher amount of crimp. A fine wool, like merino for example, can have up to a hundred creams per inch. In contrast, hair has none. It would be difficult to spin hair into yarn because individual fibers would not attach to each other. Whereas it is easy with wool, thanks to all the little creams that make them hold together. Because of all the possible characteristics of wool, the diameter, the creams, the uh, content in lipids, the natural color, the percentage of fibers of different sizes in a fleece, even the different animals it can come from, because it can be sheep, but also goats. Wools like cashmere and mohair are from goats or rabbits, like angora, or camelids, including alpacas. So there are so many variables that wool is probably the most diverse type of natural fiber. And it is also very much a product of domestication, because real wool was very rare in nature before domestication especially the domestication of species that now produce it. Wild sheep were more hairy than woolly, and archaeological discoveries suggest that the selection of sheep for their wool began around 6000 BC, about at the time when woven textiles appeared. But maybe this wool was used more for felt or other things, because the oldest known wool garments have been dated to two or three thousand years later. But the selection of sheep that produced more and more wool and less hair turned wool into a serious alternative to linen. At the time of the Roman Empire, the Mediterranean and European population wore essentially two types of material, linen and wool. Cotton was still a curiosity, and silk was extravagant, so these were not part of the life of the vast majority of the population. The two types of material are quite complementary. Wool has the advantage of impeding heat transfer. It is a good insulation material because wool fabrics have greater bulk than other textiles because of the crimp. So they hold air pockets and this is what provides thermal insulation. Linen was more adapted to warmer and drier climates, like in Egypt or big parts of the Middle East. But up to a point, when it becomes really hot, the property of wool to keep the outside heat away may be useful. And desert peoples like the Bedouins in Arabia or the Tuaregs in the Sahara used wool they used wool clothes for insulation. Early on, the different qualities of wool were used for different products. The finest ones for clothing and the coarser ones for blankets or rugs. And every single region in the Middle East and in Europe developed a wool production from keeping herds of sheep to manufacturing clothes. And the same happened around the world with local species that would be domesticated. 
For example, in South America, it was more with alpacas and llamas, or goats in India. The wool trade was a major part of European trade in the Middle Ages. A major part of the production was local for local consumption, especially in more remote areas. But by the 13th century, an international trade and division of labor took place. There were two main regions of weaving and trading that were the Low Countries, that is to say modern Belgium and the Netherlands, and Italy. Raw material converged from all of Western Europe to these regions, and the main producers of raw wool were England and to a lesser extent Spain. Actually, wool remained the main export of England for centuries, and its production was critical to the English economy, at least until the 17th century. And even after that, it remained protected. For example, at the end of the 17th century, the English crown forbade American colonies to trade wool with anyone but England. And because a great deal of the value of woolen textiles was in the dyeing and finishing, England tried to develop its own manufacturing industry. In the 14th century, it transformed only 10% of its wool into textiles, and its share went up over the following centuries. In many regions where there was an important wool manufacturing and uh, trade, this particular industry had a big impact on the development of the uh, economy and the long-term slow emergence of capitalism. Because by the end of the Middle Ages, this trade had become really serious. It generated capital that its organizers could reinvest, and it modified the organization of production in countries like England, Italy, the Netherlands, the west of Germany, the north of France, a new class of bourgeois that we could call entrepreneurs took charge of the whole production process out of the authority of guilds or states. There were still no factories or elaborate machines at this point. This would happen centuries later. But they organized and funded the whole manufacturing process. They bought raw materials and they gave work to a myriad of individual workers or small workshops. Some spinned wool to turn it into yarn, others wove it, others dyed. The supervisors bought and provided all raw materials, they paid by the piece, and they ensured the logistics too, delivering materials and uh, later retiring more elaborate products. This system was called cottage industry in England, or furlach system in Germany. In the regions where it happened, it had a lasting impact. It elevated standards of living, and it was generally well received by inhabitants from rural areas because it gave them an additional income stream, especially in the winter when they wouldn't work in the fields. It also allowed the accumulation of capital that could be invested somewhere else. Decades before the flowering of the Renaissance in Italy, this is how various families like the Medici in Florence built their fortunes in the wool trade and they used it to create the first banks or invest in other sectors. When the Industrial Revolution began, centuries after the emergence of this proto-capitalism, 
It is not a coincidence that it took off first in Great Britain and then in parts of continental Europe. The ingredients necessary for this transformation were, of course, a number of technical innovations like machines and the availability of raw materials, but also this entrepreneurial capital and spirit that had appeared long before and was ready to invest in manufacturing projects for the sake of profitability. So let's not underestimate the uh, historical importance of textile and wool specifically in uh, shaping the uh, economic world we live in. It was central to the process of capital accumulation and a new organization of production. It goes well beyond textile itself. In the 19th century, the production of wool to feed European industry followed the same path than cotton and uh, many other raw materials. It was delocalized to colonies or other parts of the world. In that case to Australia, which uh, remains the biggest wool producer in the world, New Zealand too. Other big producing countries today include China and the US. So, we made an overview of the main natural fibers that have been used for thousands of years in textiles. There are more. For example, jute, that is the plant used in textiles like burlap. But these always were the most important ones. It's interesting to know about materials, techniques, or how the textile industry contributed to shape the world. But there is yet another dimension to textile, a more psychological, social, creative one. And we're going to touch on this by taking a quick look at the history of clothing. There are two approaches to it. The first one is utilitarian. Men and women started and continued to wear clothes as protection against the climate. That's obviously a reason. But clothing also individualizes people and may be something that defines their place in the world, in society, because it indicates their status, their gender, their degree of affluence. There is no escaping these norms. Even not caring about how we dress is a statement in itself, or will be received as one. So there are also cultural and social dimensions to clothing. And the psychological one too. Clothing protects against the climate, but also against the look of others. This is where concepts like modesty, aesthetics, appeal come into play. There are social norms, but the way individuals choose to position themselves in front of these norms is very much a personal psychological posture which indicates how they see themselves, consciously or not. Will they try to stand out or blend? Will they play with the norms and be a bit provocative or observe them scrupulously? Will they pay a lot of attention to their appearance or not? And these norms change over time. A proof of the symbolic and social importance of clothing is that all societies regulate it one way or another. And actually regulation of clothing is a good indicator of how normative a society or a political regime is. The most authoritarian regimes that pretend to control how people live and what their values should be, 
also tend to enforce stricter clothing rules. You could see that in uh, communist countries or in deeply religious states and communities. They tend to highly regulate clothing norms because they express how compliant individuals are. And there's nothing new about it. Ancient societies, you can take Egypt, China, the Greeks and the Romans, they all had very explicit rules about clothing that were often turned into laws. The way people are given much more leeway to play with the norms in Western societies since the 20th century without breaking the law is uh, quite extraordinary. But it doesn't mean there are no norms. There are still rules of modesty. There is the understanding that different circumstances call for different clothing. And another characteristic of modern societies is the concept of fashion. It is hard to say precisely when fashion became a thing. Because even in ancient societies, there were changes in uh, taste and clothing evolved over time. It's a matter of speed of change and of intentionality. There is fashion when people are willing to change how people dress. In ancient societies, these changes were either very slow, very progressive, and actually so slow that they were imperceptible. Or they happened suddenly, after political events, like invasions when various cultures and approaches to clothing mixed, or after a drastic economic or social change. People could start to dress differently to express that new times had begun. But it is true that at some point in the 14th and 15th centuries in the West, something happened. After centuries of very slow change, the way people dressed began to change much faster. And an entire industry appeared progressively around this, with uh, clothes makers actively trying to innovate and invent new shapes, new types of clothes, with uh, new colors or patterns. And in the following centuries, this preoccupation about clothing descended progressively from the highest spheres of society to all other classes, becoming a popular trend. This is why the emergence of Western fashion is dated to this period, 500 years ago. And it is true that unless you are an expert, it is very hard to distinguish between clothes from the 10th and the 13th centuries. Whereas everyone can say when clothes are from the 18th, 19th or 20th centuries. And since the 20th century, we can even distinguish decades. That would have been unthinkable a few centuries back, when a new generation systematically dressed like the previous one. However, the human body has not changed and there's a limited number of archetypes of clothes that can be made. These archetypes were invented thousands of years ago, and still dress everyone. A first archetype is a draped costume, when a piece of cloth is just draped around the body. This type of clothing has become very uncommon in the West, Pareos are an example, but in the antiquity, in Greece or Rome, they were frequent for men and women alike. And in some cultures, they are still very present, like the Indian sari. Then a second type are 
pieces of cloth with a hole for the head, like a poncho. These have also become uncommon, but they were quite popular in the Middle Ages. Then there are sewn clothes, made of several pieces of cloth with sleeves, that are made to be worn either closed, like shirts or dresses. Their ancestors were tunics, or a typical piece from ancient Greece called chiton. Or they can be open like a coat. And finally, there are sheath clothes that are adjusted to fit the body, like trousers or jumpsuits. All clothes fall into these archetypes, but with the variety of materials and colors and fittings and accessories that can be added to them, possibilities are almost infinite. So let's take a look at how clothing evolved since the emergence of Western fashion. In the 15th century, as the social concern for out-of-date clothing began to exist, new pieces appeared that looked rather extravagant in comparison with previous centuries. For example, the Hoopland, which was a voluminous robe with floor-length sleeves. This later went completely out of fashion, but it never disappeared entirely in Western civilization, because it became the familiar academic and legal robes of today, the ones students wear for graduation or judges when they sit. A lot of fashion and trends in the 15th century appeared at the court of Burgundy, which at the time was particularly wealthy and influent. For men, another highlight of the century was the appearance of a type of fitting jacket called double, that was worn with hoses, which were like uh, very fitted trousers. This fashion started in Italy and Spain and spread to the rest of Europe. At the time, and it continued through the 16th century, Spanish clothing was quite influential as Spain was on the rise. It had a sobriety that was picked up by Protestant countries in Germany, in Scandinavia and the Netherlands. Less so in England, where it remained confined to Protestant circles. By the end of the 16th century, a sharp distinction in style could be seen between Protestant fashions that showed more restraint and austerity and used a lot of black, which was an uncommon color until then, and a more revealing and colorful way of dressing in France and Italy. An item of clothing that appeared in the mid-16th century is the ruff, a sort of extravagant color made of linen or lace. They were very impractical and rather useless to, other than as an ornament, which is why they became a symbol of wealth and status. As time passed, they only grew in size until they went out of favor by the middle of the 17th century. The rough illustrates very well the importance of clothing as a way to show status. It had no other justification than being decorative. It was very expensive because they quickly lost their shapes and could only be worn once until the discovery of starch that made it possible to reshape them. They had become so extravagant and 
still useless, a symbol of aristocratic shallowness that they were banned at the court of Spain in the 17th century by Philip IV. The name Elizabethan color for these pet cones that are put around the neck of dogs or cats so they can't bite or lick their body comes from these 16th and 17th century ruffs. At the end of the 17th century, fashion followed again a more extravagant direction after a few decades of restraint. Spain and Italy had lost a lot of their influence. Protestant courts had progressively abandoned part of the austerity from the previous period. And now many eyes were looking at the court of Louis XIV that set the tone. This is the moment when aristocratic men started to wear wigs, which lasted until the end of the 18th century. And uh, hoses were replaced with breeches and stockings for men, with a waistcoat and a coat. This way of clothing went through variations, but it also lasted for more than a century. Men's fashion became rather predictable, but women began to wear bigger and bigger dresses, with several layers of clothes underneath, corsets and metallic frameworks to increase volume. This style was not followed in all courts. Spain remained out of step with the fashions that arose in France and maintained the early 17th century style for longer. And so did Holland. At the time, the Netherlands were prosperous, but they had a cultural austerity that made these fashions appear immodest and over the top. A major cultural shift that appeared in the 17th century was also the distinction between men and women's approach to clothing. Men became expected to appear relatively more sober with a simpler outfit and one that didn't hinder their moves. On the opposite, women were now much more colorful with impractical outfits and dresses that were at the same time bigger and more revealing. This continued into the 19th century, and to our days, especially informal wear. If you look at a red carpet event, all men are dressed almost the same, whereas women are expected to be colorful or at least to dress different from one another. So this is the moment when fashion in clothing became more closely identified with one gender, even though there was still fashion for men, but with way slower and subtler changes. And all the industry of clothes making, accessories like jewelry, became more oriented towards women because they were now the biggest spenders and uh, the category supposedly more interested. Until the 18th century, this was not particularly the case. Men could wear as much jewelry, change outfits and spend as much as women. By the end of the 18th century, it began a bit before the French Revolution, Fashion evolved towards somewhat simpler lines, as there was a taste in general at the time for the imitation of antiquity. Not only in fashion, this movement called neoclassical also touched decorative arts or architecture. There was a brief period in France in the 1790s when clothing became much more sober. 
and less distinctive between social classes in line with the egalitarian atmosphere of the time. But it didn't last. As soon as the Napoleonic period started, the uh, old and new aristocracy returned to uh, opulent ways of dressing. The 19th century was now beginning, and with it, major changes to society and fashion. First, because until now, all these trends had happened essentially in a, a tiny group, maybe 1% or less of the population. Lower classes were influenced by royal courts, but uh, there was so much they could afford, and fashion remained a very elitist practice. Clothing for regular people had kept evolving slowly, like in previous centuries. With the Industrial Revolution, the prices of manufactured goods dropped dramatically, including textile, and overall the circle of people wealthy enough to follow fashion became bigger and bigger. The trendsetters also changed. For centuries, it had been royal courts and aristocrats. But in the 19th century, the new powerful class was the bourgeoisie, that became way wealthier and influent than the majority of old aristocratic families. In some cases, like in the US or in France, the uh, old aristocracy was non-existent or had lost much of its prestige and, as a class, had merged with the high bourgeoisie. Nineteenth-century fashion reflects for a large part the values of this new rising class. A good example of this is the Victorian society and fashion in the UK. But a similar system existed in America, in France, or in Germany. Men's fashions became much more sober, even more sober, with mainly dark colors, and the old fashion of breeches and stockings was replaced with trousers. To a large extent, we are still in this today when it comes to formal wear. Suits or tuxedos are the continuation of this way of dressing. The distinction between genders in clothing, and even more than that, the concept of decency, is something that this new class was particularly willing to enforce. This was not something entirely new. Dressing in a way that didn't conform to your gender was a big taboo in the antiquity already, and that continued in Western civilization. One of the charges against Joanne of Arc, for example, was that she had dressed like a man. But maybe because there was a perception that these uh, traditional rules could be threatened, the 19th century saw a lot of new laws that uh, put in writing the forbidden transgressions when it came to clothing. For example, women wearing trousers. This was perceived as a challenge to traditional roles, a threat to institutions like families, and in general an insult to good taste and decency. Another point that became a social concern at the end of the 19th century was the practice of sport and uh, dressing on the beach. Going to the beach to the seaside had become something the higher classes enjoyed, and with it appeared swimsuits that were initially very covering for certain periods in the 19th century. It was okay for women to show their shoulders and cleavage, but from the waist down, it was 
absolutely unacceptable. Swimsuits challenged this. They didn't show much skin until the 1920s, but like pants for women, many rules that had dominated sometimes for centuries were beginning to give way in the uh, interwar period. At first among a, a small circle, until they spread to the rest of society along the 20th century, to the point that a conservative woman in 2020 may dress in a way that would have uh, appeared very scandalous a century ago, with pants and visible ankles, visible knees, and uh, nothing to cover her head. Another trend of the late 19th century is the multiplication of fashion magazines that started to include photos and uh, helped spread fashion well beyond high society. Until the 19th century, clothes making was a, a very uh, fragmented industry. Clothes were made either at home or by independent dressmakers and seamstresses. By the end of the 19th century, and it exploded in the 20th century, a new figure appeared, the fashion designer, who creates new styles or excels at designing fine clothes. Before that, some fashion creators had a small local fame, but fashion designers and their houses became institutions that could set the tone and influence the way people dress well beyond their client base. That would be a, a whole other topic, but among them, maybe the most influential in the 20th century, because the types of silhouettes and the styles she proposed still have a, an influence nowadays, would be Gabrielle Chanel, Coco Chanel the creator of the brand of the same name. Because it has been changing so much, and also because different styles coexisted, it would be hard to summarize 20th century clothing, but compared to previous centuries, it appears to show more attention paid to comfort, less rigid rules when it comes to uh, women, they can basically use uh, all types of clothes now, and also a much more popular dimension. All classes are now concerned, thanks to the drop in the price of clothes with an industrialized production. Ready to wear is also a recent thing, it started about a century ago. And another innovation of the past century is uh, synthetic fibers. They are present in many clothing articles, alone or combined with natural fibers. They are responsible for a decline in the production of some natural fibers, like wool or silk, because they quickly became cheaper and have useful specific properties too. The first of these fibers to be commercialized was viscose, at the beginning of the 20th century. It is not truly synthetic because it is made of cellulose, of wood, but it is artificial. Truly synthetic fibers made from hydrocarbons mainly appeared from the 1920s to the 1940s. The main ones are nylon, which for various uses could replace silk for a fraction of the cost, for example in military parachutes or ropes, or when it comes to clothing for stockings. Another major discovery is polyester, which is a category of polymers. When turned into fibers, Polyesters can be used to produce very cheap clothes. Synthetic fibers have a few advantages. 
apart from the cost. They tend to be more durable and they readily pick up different dyes. They also offer functions that natural fibers don't have. They can stretch much more or be waterproof or stain resistant. They are not attractive to insects that damage fabrics neither. The cons are that they generally provide poor insulation because they cannot trap air like wool or even cotton. They are also more prone to heat damage and they can burn or melt quickly. They are generally not very skin friendly. They don't cause allergies like natural fibers can, but they don't let the skin breathe and they don't absorb moisture, so they become sticky when the body sweats. And a bigger concern is for the environment. They shed tiny particles of plastics when they are washed and are a source of microplastics that are not biodegradable and end up in our rivers and our seas. Well, as usual, there would be many more things to tell you, but we will end our story here for tonight. I hope you enjoyed it, and it gives you the curiosity to investigate some of these topics. For now, you can let go or pick another story from my library if you wish to. Thank you very much for your attention, and sleep well. Au revoir.